you much. Good afternoon. Welcome. Bienvenidos to the third Rural Oral Health Symposium focused on disparities and how to create health equity in our rural communities. On behalf of Natasha Kouluris, the Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs, and Cheryl Donald, Region 2 IE, IEA Regional Administrator for New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands, and all of my HRSA um, colleagues, I bring you greetings and I want to thank you for your, for your working tirelessly to increase diversity, inclusion, and address the needs of marginalized populations, especially in rural communities during this COVID-19 pandemic. If it's okay with all of you, I'd like to take an audible. Some call it a change in play if you like to play football. Um, of my presentation only so that I can better follow the flow and not duplicate my esteemed colleagues who spoke previously. Um, Mr. Tom Ford, the director of FORRHP, um, Dr. Bram, the former uh, HRSA AA and director, former director of FORHP, Ms. Sarah O'Donnell and Mr. Paul Moore, and correction, Mr. Tom Morris, forgive me. So often in, in my travels across the great nation to listen to the concerns of people from rural communities to improve resources and funding in the places where they live, I am asked, why are some areas considered rural by our state or territory and yet not by all other federal agencies for federal funding purposes? Well, the answer is simple. And it's actually in our excellent Rural Health Information Hub, a wonderful resource of information for all things rural and funded by HRSA. There are actually several definitions of rural utilized by the federal government, by different federal agencies for grant funding, as well as for policy, law, and research. The census defines rural as any housing or territory not in an urban area. The census and the Office of Management and Budget actually have very similar criteria they, that are based on the size of the community, urbanized areas or metropolitan statistical areas of 50,000 or more, urban clusters or micropolitan statistical areas of 10,000 to 49,000 people, and rural or non-core counties outside of these areas. If we look at Hearst's definition of rural, we use a combination of these definitions plus what are called RUCA or Rural Urban Community Area Codes as it's, uh, for its Rural Health Grants Eligibility Analyzer. So when looking at grant funding from federal government or any place else, we encourage you to check eligibility first. So how do all of these definitions come together to address rural health disparities, especially oral ones to create health equity for persons living in rural communities? Well, the history of migrant and rural health is long and fascinating, but we don't have time for that today. For the migrant history, I, re I would refer you to an informative slideshow on the National Center for Farm Worker Health webpage. The Migrant Health Act was first funded in 1962. This was subsequently followed by the funding and the consolidation of community, rural, health care for the homeless, public housing, and school-based health. Later on, we added Ryan White for HIV all of which provide a significant range of services touching the lives of people living in rural communities, regardless of which definition is utilized. Whether one looks at migrant or rural health services in California or in Rincón, Puerto Rico, a formal rural health initiative where I received my training in primary care, rural health and public health, the health issues and concerns and challenges of rural people are far more similar than different. We really experienced this during the past two years. So many of you addressed the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic faced by people all over the world, including our rural communities. Thinking outside of the box, you brought to the attention of our offices and addressed so many critical issues and needs impacting the pandemic from the lack of and crowded housing for persons living and serving in our, in our areas to the difficulties with telehealth due to the digital divide spoken about earlier, due to challenges with broadband as well as the devices people can afford. You provided education, screening, testing, treatment, vaccination in multicultural and multilingual manner. You helped so many people in rural communities 
including the leadership and staff providing oral health who shifted and pivoted gears to provide these services as well as oral health services at great, at great risk to themselves and their families. So we would like to say thank you. So let me get back to the slides, just a few of them. So next, so we'll, we'll start with this slide. So HRSA is the federal agency charged with increasing access to healthcare for those in need through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees, supporting more than 90 programs and oral health edu education, training, and patient care. These programs provide healthcare to people who are geographically isolated, economically, and medically vulnerable. Our mission is to provide health equity in underserved communities through on-the-ground outreach education, technical assistance, and collaborating with local, state, federal organizations, and more. Next slide, please. Thank you. You saw a slide similar to this earlier. I would like to share just a few recent changes in the HRSA organizational structure that reflect the changing in the healthcare landscape and, and positions of HRSA to better serve the needs of our communities and priorities. One of them, which most of you are probably familiar with, is the Provider Relief Bureau. The Provider Relief Bureau oversees the $178 billion Provider Relief Fund that reimburses healthcare providers for healthcare related to expenses and lost revenues attributed to the coronavirus. This is detailed in a later slide, which you can view at your leisure. Also, the Office of Advancement of Telehealth. The Office of Advancement of Telehealth, which was formerly located in FORHP, is now part of the Office of the Administrator and HHS's focal point for telehealth in all settings from rural to large cities. We have seen extraordinary growth in telehealth during the pandemic, including in telehealth dentistry. Next, please. Okay, the Office of Regional Operations is now known as the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. I'm going to repeat that. The Office of Regional Operations, ORO, is now known as the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. We have 10 regional offices. We are headquartered in Rockville, have a sub-regional office in Puerto Rico. And as I said earlier, Ms. Natasha Kalouris is the director of IEA and headquarters. And Ms. Cheryl Donnell is our regional administrator for Region 2, New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. <coughs> Excuse me. HRSA IEA works closely with state, local governments, internal, external stakeholders, including CBOs and FBOs, and leading our tribal partnerships. This is new, yet extremely important to know because Native Americans suffer the poorest oral health of any population in the United States, who, and many live in rural communities. IEA gathers and assesses healthcare issues and trends that impact HRSA's programs and stakeholders. IEA staff share information with headquarters, which has resulted in changes in policy, funding, resources, such as what has transpired in COVID-19 and the needs of persons in rural communities, including migrant and seasonal farm workers. Next. Okay, so this is the core of our activities. IEA addresses COVID-19, opioids, of course, other substance um, use disorders, behavioral health, and it's important to note in behavioral health, this includes the oral health needs related to substance use disorders such as meth mouth and other behavioral health medications. Maternal child health, including oral health, preventing baby bottle tooth decays, sealants in children and maternal oral health. And please, I didn't mention my colleague, Ms. Krishana Lee is probably on the line and she is our representative in region two from the Maternal Child Health Bureau. And EHE, that stands for ending the HIV epidemic, including the oral health needs of many people living with HIV and AIDS. Next. So the American Rescue Plan. I just wanted to highlight again, the tremendous amount of funding that we have um, for this program, $178 billion. Next. Okay, so I want to take a minute and focus on the slide. Um, I just want to point out one correction under the second bu bullet. That should be um, 584,536 total patients in New Jersey. 
of which 147,237 are dental patients. So the U.S. Surgeon General's Oral Health in America brought national attention to the importance and disparities in oral health. The Institute of Medicine report improving access to oral health care for vulnerable and underserved populations showed the unmet need for oral health care and barriers faced by those populations and how they have a great impact on overall health. HRSA serves 6.7 million patients in terms of oral health care with 17.3 million visits. We have almost 20,000 oral health full-time equivalents working at health centers and they're delineated by, by the uh, specialty below. Next. Okay, so I just wanna focus on a few more things. Um, the number of the patients that we saw during 2020 and 2021 decreased in terms of seeing people face to face, but we saw a lot more people using telehealth, including teledentistry. We would like to recognize and thank the many oral health leaders and staff who stepped in to assist with COVID-19 care while also providing oral health care services. I want to follow up on something that was mentioned earlier um, about graduate medical education and oral health workforce. At HRSA, we've been funding general dentistry and pediatric dentistry for many years. We've also had oral health training in our community health centers. But now, as was mentioned, we are having more funding for graduate medical, graduate medical education in dentistry in rural health communities. Now, we want to mention here that HRSA serves many people in rural communities. The numbers you see in front of you is just a small percentage when we look at all of our, our services that we provide. Next. And as I mentioned in the workforce, it is very robust in rural communities, but we need many more. And I want to remind this group that don't let education and the cost of education be a barrier through the National Health Service Corps, National Health uh, Scholarships, nursing scholarships, and many other programs, we can provide the funding for people to be educated and provide oral health care, as well as medical care and nursing care. Next, Maternal Child Health Block Grant. I mentioned this earlier. I can't say enough about this. Through our Maternal Child Health Block Grant, we serve women, infants, and children and adolescents in all the states. And that includes oral health for pregnant mommies. And we know that their oral health can impact the health of the baby they're carrying, as well as preventing baby bottle tooth decay, as well as providing sealants for children. Next. And uh, this is just about rural moms. This is rural maternity and obstetrical management strategies. This is a wonderful program. And it's really to address what you heard earlier. As our number of hospitals decrease, so do our services for obstetrical care. And it's so needed for women living in rural communities. Next. So earlier, you heard about this. You heard about our wonderful Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. These are just some highlights. Um, next. I want to just remind everybody, as was mentioned earlier, please, please, please sign up for our HRSA Federal Office of Rural Health Policy weekly announcements. It has wonderful information, also grant opportunities, and lots of information about the most current research in rural health. Next. And this was the Rural Health Information Hub I mentioned earlier. Please visit it. Next. And this is just the website for our Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. Next. Just some additional resources. Next. And I just want to close with contact information. As I mentioned earlier, Ms. Cheryl Donald is our Regional Administrator for Region 2. Captain Shandi Ghosh, um, who I believe is, is also on the Zoom today, is our Deputy Regional Administrator. And I'm Dr. Raggio. Next. For those of you who are into social media, connect with HRSA. Follow us on Twitter and all of these other wonderful uh, social media sites. Next. That's it. Thank you very much. And I turn it over to my next colleague.